الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. My beloved brothers, sisters and elders in Islam, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Allah says in the Quran, سورة الإسراء, verses 18 to 19. After أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. من كان يريد العجلة عجلنا له فيها ما نشا لمن نريد. Whoever wants the hasty life, whoever wants the hasty life, meaning whosoever is chasing after dunya, whosoever is chasing after dunya, عجلنا له فيها ما نشا لمن نريد. We will hasten his reward for him in the dunya. But we will give him what we want to give him. And we will give to whom we want to give. Let's just say that again. Whosoever aims for the dunya in what he does, Allah will give him of the dunya what Allah wants to give. And Allah will give to whom Allah wants to give. So it will not be based upon his effort. It will be based on whether Allah wants to give him and it will be based on how much Allah wants to give him. It will not be based upon his effort. And since he made no effort for the year after, there will be no year after for him in the sense of Jannah. So Allah goes further and Allah says, ثُمَّ جَعَلْنَا لَهُ جَهَنَّمَةً and then we will make his outcome, we will make his eventual abode, we will make it Jahannam. Ya Salaha, which he will enter, madhmuman, blameworthy. Madhura, and distanced from the mercy of Allah. So if the aim is the dunya, you will get of the dunya. But you will only get if Allah wants to give you. And you will only get what Allah wants to give you. How much Allah wants to give you. And of the year after, you will have nothing. When you enter into the year after, you will not be praiseworthy, you will be blameworthy. When you enter into the year after, you will not enjoy the mercy of Allah. You will be distanced from the mercy of Allah. And Allah goes further and Allah says, وَمَنْ أَرَادَ الْآخِرَةَ But whosoever in his worldly endeavors, his aim is the year after. وَمَنْ أَرَادَ الْآخِرَةَ وَسَعَى لَهَا سَعْيَهَا And he makes the effort of the year after. You cannot just desire Jannah, but you do not make the effort of Jannah. You cannot desire to be of those whom Allah is pleased with, but you do not make the necessary effort that goes with it. What did the Prophet ﷺ say? The Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّ سِلْعَةَ اللَّهِ غَالِيَةَ أَلَا in the silat Allah he al jannah. The product of Allah is expensive. Behold, the product of Allah is jannah. The product of Allah is expensive. So there's something Allah is offering, but it doesn't come for free. In fact, the price is high. The price is high. So there's a necessary effort for the year after. The year after is not just going to fall at your feet. You're going to have to work for it. And the other condition is who are mu'min, that he must be a believer. If somehow he does not possess sound creed, correct aqidah, but for some unknown reason, there is correct practice, then still it will not be accepted. Because it was not done to please Allah. It was not done to please Allah. An example of this is Mother Teresa. She was a good woman, a nun who worked in Calcutta and who fed the poor and looked after them. But for who did she do it? Did she do it for that one being? There's no one worthy of worship but him. La ilaha illallah. Did she do it for that being? Or did she do it for Jesus? Who's the creation of that being? Yes, his chosen messenger. At a, at a certain moment in time, but not God. He's not one for whom things must be done. You understand? Things can be done 
to please him but with the niyat, ultimate niyat of pleasing Allah you understand not to please him and to please him solely because he is your God a good example of this is where a husband buys his wife flowers for 40 years he's been trying to get him to do something romantic doesn't do it she was thinking maybe he might buy her some flowers 40 years he doesn't she was thinking maybe he would take her on a vacation 40 years he doesn't she was thinking maybe he could buy her a diamond ring 40 years he doesn't one day she comes home her entire bedroom is filled with red roses she suddenly presented with two tickets for a holiday to the Bahamas and he suddenly gives her a ring a diamond ring as big as your eyeball so initially she's blown away Allahu Akbar all my du'as have been accepted all three in one go afterwards she starts thinking but this is odd man for 40 years I cannot get him to do one thing and then suddenly he does all three I smell something fishing over, fishy over here and she starts to scratch about, she has a look on his, on his WhatsApp. What is happening over there? She doesn't have a right to. It's spying in Islam. The Jesus. You understand? But that has never stopped husbands and wives in the year 2019, in the year 2020, sorry. It has never stopped them from doing these things. So she goes and she has a look. And she discovers that he has had an affair. So why is he doing all of this? He's doing this to assuage his own conscience. His conscience is feeling bad. So this is why he's doing it. So I ask you now, what is the value of the roses? Suddenly. What is the value of the ring? Does she want it? Will she be going with him on the holiday? Certainly to buy a wife roses is a good thing. Certainly to buy a diamond ring is a good thing. Certainly to take her on a holiday is a good thing. But the reason is problematic. So to perform salah but not to please Allah, to go for hajj but not to please Allah, to pay zakat and give sadaqah but not to please Allah, do not expect a reward by Allah if it is not done for Allah. What does the Prophet say? He says in the Hadith of Qudsi that Allah says, Ana aghna shurakai and shirk. Of all those that are given partners, I am the most independent. Man ashraka bi taraktuhu wa shirkahu. Whosoever does any act, but in doing the act, not only does he want to please me, he wants to please somebody else. So there's an element of shirk in there. I leave him and I leave his act of shirk. I am not interested in it. Allahu Akbar. So the right thing is to desire the akhirah. To make effort for the akhirah. To ensure that you have the right belief and do things for the right reasons. If you fall in this category, so Allah says, such a people they will find that the efforts will be much appreciated Allah will appreciate everything that they do even if it is little in amount in Islam quality is more important than quantity yes there is a minimum quantity like you must make five times a day salah you can't make four you can't make three you can't make two but after the minimum quantity is fulfilled, the rest is all about quality. This is why on the day of Qiyamah, they do not count your deeds. On the day of Qiyamah, they weigh your deeds. Had it been an issue of quantity, they would have counted. But since it is an issue of quality, they weigh. And Allah knows best. These two verses that I have recited, it is a preamble an introduction to what I'm about to discuss insha'Allah so to jump into it let's ponder for a moment on life in the year after life in the akhirah let's ponder for a moment in the fact that it is eternal time without end can you imagine such a thing Let's ponder for a moment in the innumerable enjoyments and delights of Jannah. Every delight that will satisfy you 100%. Let's ponder in this for a moment. And then let us compare it to the dunya. If you compare the dunya to the akhirah, the dunya it pales 
in comparison. How long am I going to live? Around 65 years, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. But what is 65 years when compared to eternity? What about the pleasures that I'm enjoying? It's, 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 it's not fully satisfactory. You understand? It doesn't fulfill me 100%. And it comes to an end very quickly. So how can this compare to the year after? What did the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him say? He said, if you were to take a whip and you were to place it in the Akhirah, so in this particular case in Jannah, then the area that is covered by that whip in Jannah, it will actually be more important than the entire dunya and everything that it contains. So the dunya and everything that it contains, it is not the equivalent of that amount of area that is covered by a whip. If this reality enters your heart, you will forget about dunya. Your focus will just be the akhirah. You will forget about every creation. Your focus will only be your creator. What is the dunya life? One moment I am born. I suffer pain during birth. My mother suffers pain. The next moment I die. Also with some discomfort. Might even say some pain. In between my birth and my death. Some enjoyment. Some suffering. What? A test. Every day. Choices being made. One choice after the next. Every choice has its consequence. If I make the right choice, I enjoy dunya and I enjoy akhirah. If I make the wrong choice, I suffer dunya and I suffer in the akhirah. Between birth and death, one choice after the next. One test after the next. Every choice I make, it brings me a little bit closer to either my jannah or it brings me a little bit closer to either my jahannam. At this moment in time, there's a place in Jannah with your name on. And a place in Jahannam with your name on. Everything that you do builds either the one place or the other place. So either you are building your Jannah or you are building your Jahannam. By the choices we make every day, thus determines which of the two locations we are building. In the dunya, there are two types of people. There is the one that believes that the dunya is all that there is. And so this person strives only for the dunya. This is the way of the disbeliever. But unfortunately there are some people who call themselves Muslim. They claim to possess Iman in their heart. But their limbs, meaning the actions that they do, their actions are the same as the kufar. So how is it that you say that your inside is different, yet your outside is the same as the disbeliever? The disbeliever does not believe in the year after. There is no Jannah to strive for. There is no Jahannam to avoid. The entire focus is the dunya. I strive for the pleasures of the dunya. I strive to avoid the difficulties of the dunya. So as a disbeliever, I live in a certain way. I do certain things. Then we have another who says that he is a Muslim. So if he is a Muslim, he must believe that there is a Jannah and he must strive for it. And if he is a Muslim, he must believe that there is a Jahannam and he must make effort to avoid it. But when we look at his actions, when we look at his attitude, when we look at what is on his tongue, it is exactly the same what the disbeliever is saying. Were it not that he had told me his name is Muxin? Or Ibrahim, or Muhammad even in certain cases, I wouldn't have known that he is a Muslim. I wouldn't have known, because I have no access to his heart. I have only access to his deeds. That's why the law in Islam, the ulama teach us, نَحْكُمُ بِالظَّوَاهِرُ وَأَمَّا السَّرَائِرُ فَإِلَى اللَّهِ We judge people based upon what is apparent to us, meaning what they do on their limbs. As for what is in their hearts, 
that we live in the hands of Allah. That we live in the hands of Allah. That's why Allah told that one Sahabi who didn't believe the other man had embraced Islam and on the battlefield still took his life. Allah asked that Sahabi, Afashakakta an qalbihi. Afashakakta an qalbihi. Did you cut open his heart to know that he had only said that to defend himself against you? How would you know? How would you know what is in the heart of another? We cannot know what is in the heart of another. That is what Allah does. We only know what is on the limbs. So if we see somebody coming to the masjid, we see somebody performing salah, we see somebody going for hajj, we see somebody fasting the month of Ramadan, we see somebody paying zakat, then we understand, mashallah, you are a believer. Reciting Quran, mashallah. Coming for the lessons of Quran and Hadith, of fiqh, tafsir, mashallah. Striving for your jannah. But if we don't find you in the masjid, we find you only in your business, we find you in the disco, we find you only at the holiday resort. You're not looking like a Muslim. Do we are shocked to hear your name? Muhsin. Sometimes you don't even want to be known as Muhsin. Or Abu Bakr. Or Yusuf. You want to be known as Joe. The name your mother and father gave you is Yusuf. But popularly you are known as Joe. Mo. You understand? Muhammad. But your name is Mo. And Joe. You understand? Why? Allah gave you such a beautiful name. Your mother and father chose for you. But you don't want to be called by that name. You want to be called by a name that doesn't show that you are Muslim. You understand? Why would you want to do that? When last did you see a man with a beard and a kurta enter a disco? When last did you see a man with a beard and a kurta enter a whole house? It's easier to do that if you shave that beard off. It is easier for you to do that if you don't wear that thobe. It is easier for you to do that if you take that kofia off. So it starts with all of that. It is easier when you are not known as Muhammad. Rather you are known as Mo. And Allah knows best. This is the one individual. The other individual with regards to the Akhirah, this is the true believer insha'Allah. Who understands what is the purpose of the world, of the dunya. And he uses the dunya to achieve success in the akhirah. It doesn't mean that he does not partake of the dunya. No. He partakes enough that is needed. But after taking what is needed, his focus is the akhirah. This individual is approach is holistic. This individual is approach is balanced. Some ulama, when they discuss our relationship with the dunya and the akhirah, they discuss the two wings of a bird. And they say that there's one individual, he flies only with his dunya wing. So what happens when a bird flies only with one wing? The other individual flies only with his akhirah wing. So what happens to the bird? But what if the bird flew with both wings? Dunya was in the place where dunya needs to be. And Akhirah is in the place where Akhirah needs to be. The attention that must be given to the dunya is given. And the attention that must be given to the Akhirah is given. This is the holistic way. Allah does not want you to suffer. Allah does not want you to give up all of your dunya. Allah wants only some of your time. Allah wants only some of your money. Allah wants only a little bit of your effort. Allahu Akbar. I've mentioned this numerous times. How much money does Allah want from you? If I speak of zakat, for example. In the first place, it doesn't go to Allah directly. It goes to poor Muslims, for example. And how much does Allah want from you? After you've spent your money in every way that you can imagine, the money that is left, and you weren't using it for a full year, that money, if it is over a certain amount, Allah wants you to take 2,5% and give to the poor. Eight categories mentioned in the Quran. One of which is the poor. This is what Allah wants. How much does your government want? Every time when I buy something, 15% vet. How much are they taking from my salary? 
Minimum 10%. Minimum. So every month the government takes 25%. 10% is taken before I even use the money. 15% is taken every time I use the money. How much does your Allah want? Who is the better one? Who is the better one? Certainly your Allah is the better one. Turn to your Allah. Focus on your Allah. We are not saying do not obey your government. We are not saying do not fulfill your obligations to your government. But understand that your Allah is a shakur. Most appreciative. Understand that your Allah wants little. But he gives much. Understand that your Allah wants some. But he gives everything. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Now my dear brother, sister and elder in Islam. Whether you accept the division that I've just given you. These two type of humans or not. All you need to do is look around you. And observe. There are seasons of the year. And every season exposes. It exposes who is the Muslim, the true believer, and who is the disbeliever. It exposes the munafiq also. The one who claims to have iman in his heart. But it is not on his limbs. One season is Ramadan. In Ramadan we see who is the believer and who is not the believer. Who turns to his Allah. Ramadan is like the red in the sail. Ramadan is like the world cup. If you're a soccer fanatic. If you're a soccer fanatic and it is your team. And they are playing tomorrow the finals. You know when you're going to start standing in that line. Some people stand in that line four days before him. Allahu Akbar. He puts a tent in the line. To guarantee that he gets a ticket. You understand? A tent he puts in the line. He sleeps in the line. But when your Allah is his red angel sale. When your Allah is his world cup Ramadan. Then what is happening? The ummah is asleep. The ummah is in ghafla. In unmindfulness. Ramadan exposes the true believers. And those that aren't true. That is one season. There's another season that exposes. And that season is ending now. It is one that what is known in Cape Town as the festive season. Now in the end of the year. People sit with free time. And what do the ulama say? The ulama say. An empty mind is the devil's playground. When you've got nothing to do. You're going to fall into haram. Free time. Lots of money. Because most people at the end of the year, they get a 13th check. Generally not the imams. You understand? But most other people, they get a 13th check. So that check is beyond your budget. So now people want to spend it. And in Cape Town, we've designed phrases to facilitate sin. That's most state for others. If your men there by this time for work, and there's time to rest, then that is good. But if you mend their by, there's time to be obedient and there's time to be disobedient. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. You just facilitated sin. And if you understood what you just said, there's time to obey Allah and there's time to disobey Allah. Then you must understand in the year after there's time to go to Jannah and there's time to go to Jannah. You must understand the reality of what you've just said. Another phrase in Cape Town was was most amal young. We all used to be young. Meaning goodbye, when I was young I sinned. Maybe that's the truth. When I was young I sinned. But what do the ulama say? Ashababu shu'batu min al junun. Youth is a branch of insanity. When you're young, you're crazy. You're mad. So maybe when I was young, I was crazy. But you see, I gained my sanity. I gained my sanity. Now I want to try and raise my children in a manner better than what I had lived. Should I now give allowance to them to enter into the insanities I entered into yesterday? And to suffer what I suffered yesterday? Or should I learn from the mistakes of the past and pass that wisdom to my children? At the end of the year, Allah is forgotten like crazy. Allah is forgotten like crazy. We take example from disbelievers. We take example. We enter into sin. Our families are inviting us to sin. Husband is inviting wife, wife is inviting husband. Children are saying, must we be cooped up in the house all day? There's a way to do this in a halal fashion. Why must it be done in a haram fashion? 
Allah doesn't have a problem with your natural need. So if you have a natural need to relax, mashallah, Allah wants you to do it. If you have a natural need to do some play, mashallah, Allah wants you to do it. Some R&R, &R, rest and recuperation. But you must figure out how to do it in a manner that is pleasing to your Allah. The problem by your Allah is not your need. The problem by your Allah is the vehicle of fulfillment. If the vehicle of fulfillment is halal, your Allah is pleased. If the vehicle of fulfillment is haram, your Allah is displeased. If you look at marriage, why do we marry? So we marry for emotional intimacy, when we marry for physical intimacy. In marriage, when you engage in physical intimacy with your lawful husband and your lawful wife, Allah rewards you for it. What did the Prophet of Allah say? Fi budi ahadikum sadaqah. Your privates possess the potential of charity. You engage in physical intimacy with your husband, with your wife, Allah gives you the reward of sadaqah. What did the Sahaba say? Ya Rasulullah, ayati ahaduna shahwatahu wa fihi ajr. One of us who falls is, is physical desire, but he still gets reward. <coughs> How could that be, O oh Messenger of Allah? And the Prophet of Allah's response was, what if he placed this private in a haram place? Meaning, if you place it in a haram place, there's punishment. And if you place it in the right place, there is reward. That is how it works. So in fulfilling your need in a halal fashion, not only is that a neutral level, no, that is a positive level in Islam. You will be rewarded, inshallah. So during the season, there are people that sold their iman numerous ways. In our age, we want to be PC, politically correct. So we go over to our Christian brothers and sisters and we tell them, uh, Merry Christmas to you. Merry Christmas. What does that mean? Merry Christmas to you. Christmas is a religious practice of a people that aren't believers. So it involves kufr. It involves shirk. Do you say to somebody else, Merry kufr? Merry shirk? Why don't you say to that guy around the corner is dating that girl, happy zina? Why don't you do that? Huh? There's less sin in telling that brother happy zina than to say to somebody, Merry Christmas. You understand? When the thing involves the birth of their God, they celebrate their God. You understand? And you tell them, Merry. Meaning happy. Happy kufar, happy shirk. Huh? You want to be PC? Treat your Christian brother, your Christian sister, treat them well. Your associate at work, your colleague, treat them well. But you do not need to get involved in the kufr. You do not need to get involved in the sin. Some of us, what are we saying at work? We all worship the same God. You're saying to your Christian brother, your Christian sister, your Jewish brother, your Jewish sister, we all worship the same God. If you're not read Surah Kafirun, La a'abudu ma ta'abudun. I do not worship what you worship, you do not worship what I worship. For you is your deen, for me is my deen. But now you are telling people, your God and my God is in the same God. My God's name is Allah, my God is one, your God is three. You got the Father, you got the Son, then you got the Holy Ghost also in between. But it's the same God. How is this possible? Don't sell your Iman. In trying to be nice to your Christian brother and Christian sister. Be nice to them. Treat them kindly. Give them charity. Charity of the money. Charity of assistance. Charity of good kalam. Good words. But do not sell your faith. And do not get involved in their practices. And then finally my dear brothers. To conclude. There is a new season that we are entering into now. And it is the season of sending our children to school. And so now the question will be, where are your priorities? Are your priorities the academics of your child? Or is your priorities the iman of your child? And the amal, the good deeds of your child? So what is happening? We know of cases in the Muslim community where the focus was academics. You know what is the outcome of that? The outcome of that is many young boys and young girls that have chosen to become atheists, to abandon Islam. Many that are now saying that they are homosexuals, gay, lesbian. Many that are saying, I want to personally interpret the Quran. My opinion is this ayah means this. And what makes your opinion 
better than my opinion. So I ask you, my Muslim brother, my elder, my sister in Islam, many prophets Allah sent without books, 124,000 according to one hadith. Many prophets Allah sent without books. How many books did Allah send without prophets? And the answer is, none. Why send no book without a prophet? So that the prophet can explain to you what the book is. So the Quran tells me, make salah. And what does the Prophet of Allah say? Sallu kama raitu muni usalli. Make salah as you see me making salah. The Quran says, perform hajj. And what does the Prophet of Allah say? Khudu anni manasikakum. Take your hajj rituals from me. So the Prophet of Islam, he explains the Quran. Because he is the one that was chosen by Allah. He is the one that was sent to us. The final ummah of Islam. He is the one that interprets the Quran and we take his interpretation. And Allah knows best. But this is when you send your children to the wrong school. Are the Muslim schools really doing so bad? Tarun Naim, uh, Girls High, since its inception, is at 100% pa uh, matric pass rate. Star International, not 100% uh, Muslim school, but it has a Muslim ethos. It is registered amongst the top 10 highest schools in Western Cape. So in most cases, you claim that the academics is lower. It isn't the truth. And to be honest with you, even if it were the truth, I would rather want a child that cannot count than a child that goes to Jahannam. That is what I would rather want. But this is not what is happening at the Muslim schools. The basics of education are being passed. In fact, and this is not... This is not to downgrade the importance of secular knowledge, academic knowledge, but I ask you honestly, in your life, the Senate 8, the Senate 9, the Senate 10 that you did, how much has it helped you? When I was in Standard 8, we learned how to calculate the weight of planets. Why? Am I going to need to move Mars one day? So I need to know what type of bakimas I bring for the load? Why do I need to know what is the weight of Mars? Huh? That is for a particular scientist that's going to enter that field. It's not for everybody. A lot of what is happening in high school is a waste. You understand? The basics that you learned in primary school, those are the things that were true education that you are using today. Knowledge is designed for action. If you're not going to be doing the action, you don't need the knowledge. If you're going to be doing the action, you need the knowledge. Anyway, this is a mess of discussion and my time has run out. I hope with these few words that I was able to benefit you, inshallah, to give you a better understanding of, 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 of dunya and akhra, and to inshallah instill in you a bit, a bit of the fire, the desire to work for your jannah and to turn away from your akhra. Dunya is a thing that must be used to please Allah. Dunya is a thing that must be used to gain your jannah. Dunya is not a thing to fall in love with. It's like money. Money is not the root of all evil. Love of money is the root of all evil. Dunya is not the problem. Love of dunya is the problem. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa lisa'ir al-muslimin al-muslimat wa astaghfiruhu innahu al-ghafuru rahim.